is Jennifer going to go first and show some slides or anything like that? Or is it less, less formal than that? I think it's significantly less formal than that. But uh, Jen, if you want to go first, you're welcome to. Um, otherwise, I would um, just go ahead and start answering the questions that we got from Daryl. Yeah, I think, I think, well, I think we can maybe answer one of Daryl's questions. The question about the, the different capabilities of the robots and the costs is a good one to review. And a little bit of that is in the handout in various places. And then we can maybe take questions from chat. Um, maybe I'll start by um, just sharing the, um, the handout visually so people can see. Okay. Yeah, so that handout is identical to the one from Tuesday, but the third mm -hmm. page is what we've added that's new in case people are seeing the same thing again. It's really nice to see so many familiar names in the, uh, in the, <laughs> the meeting. The, the two uh, more informal Zoom meetings yesterday were just full of about 60 people with those names you recognize from GSA, et cetera. Yeah, it's great. All right, it's 12, it's well, here in Miss Colorado, it's 12 o'clock. I'll say it's the top of the hour now for wherever you are. Um, welcome to the follow-up session um, in the GSA and NAGT Remote Digital Tools webinar series related to GigaPans. So for those of you that were able to catch the Tuesday webinar, that was a more formal presentation. But the number of questions that were left at the at then and that have come in since um, was more than can be handled in a one hour webinar. And we wanted to give you a chance as we did last week with the Google Earth and will also be available next year, next week with the um, virtual landscapes webinar, a chance to talk to the presenters and, and be able to have more of a back and forth uh, related to questions. So on your screen right now, you can see the handout that they prepared. It's the same one, and I'm putting it for a third time into the chat in case people are still joining and we'll do it a couple more times. It's the one that went um, out to everybody, was available on Tuesday, uh, but they have added more to it. And in addition to answering questions, they will, I believe this third page here, um, is, is additional from what you might have downloaded in a PDF on Tuesday. Uh, and then they'll, they'll also walk through what some of the, the resources are here. I just help get people closer towards being able to um, implement GigaPants. I am Beth, I am just on the NAGT and GSA committee related to this. And so now I'm just going to step back, turn off my camera and hand it over to Jennifer um, and, and Callan from here. Okay, well, it's great to have everybody here. Jennifer and I are joined by our colleague, Bill Richards today. So I want to just note that Bill is there as well. He's um, also got his video on. So um, Bill is another gigapanner and um, he's has some specific information to share uh, regarding a, a couple of um, technical questions um, that have been raised. Um, I wanna say thanks to everybody for being here and thanks to all your great questions and the attendance on Tuesday. Um, I'm really psyched uh, at all the emails that I've gotten uh, since Tuesday. I've, I've had quite a few. Jennifer, I'm sure that's true for you as well. Um, uh, people asking questions and, and being excited about things. So um, so we've got some, some stuff to go over. Um, Jen, do you want me to lead with those questions that we got? Okay. So Daryl, I'm pleased to see that you were able to join the call. Um, but Daryl sent us uh, some questions earlier about um, several different topics. So I'll just uh, go ahead and read them out. And um, guys, I'll take a stab at um, answering them. And then Jen and Bill, if you wanna um, add something else, please do. So the first is, can you summarize the major differences before, between the four Gigapan robots that are, uh, available from Omega Brand S? Um, so the... Um, there's a dichotomy, which is basically between the two low-end ones and the two high-end ones. So I think that's probably the most important dichotomy, which is that the, the, the low-end ones are smaller and they can um, only handle cameras up to a certain size. And as I pointed out on Tuesday, they um, function, the robot controls the camera with a, a little robot finger that presses the shutter button. 
um, which has caused problems for me. And so I prefer the higher end models, the uh, Epic Pro, um, because it is electronically controlled. So there's a little cable that connects the robot to your camera and that allows it to fire. So there's um, fewer opportunities there for missed signals. I do not know what the difference is between the two high-end models. There's the, the uh, Epic Pro and the um, Epic Pro V. Um, so uh, I'm not sure what the distinction is there. Um, between the two lower end models, um, basically it's a question of point and shoots versus point and shoots plus uh, small DSLRs. So that's the key difference there. Jen and Bill, what would you add to that? Um, I would add um, in the difference between the, the two smaller models, the I think the Epic 100 is maybe just a tiny bit more robust if you're doing as I do and you're just throwing it in your field pack. Um, and the Epic 100 does have a remote shutter trigger option. There's an accessory you can, can buy for that. It's only compatible with Canon E3 cameras. Um, I poked around earlier the, in the difference between the, the two Epic Pro models. The Epic Pro V has some video and time lapse capability. I think it's just a firmware update. But to be honest, I have not used it. So I, I can't be um, um, truthful on what that difference is. I, as I said during the webinar, I prefer the Epic 100 just because it's of its lighter weight. But if you want to use a DSLR, you really need the Epic Pro. Go ahead, uh, Bill, if you have any, any additional thoughts you'd like to add, that'd be great. Just one little bit with the Epic Pro. You, uh, you get cables for all the major camera models for communicating. So that, that's included. Uh, you don't have to go buy separate cables. I, pretty much every model of DSLR is supported by the Epic Pro. Yeah, excellent point. Okay, next question is, um, how long does it take to photograph a typical outcrop? Um, we may have touched on this briefly, um, but um, to reiterate, if we did touch on it, um, it completely varies. So it depends on how big of a shoot you're doing. So that's the main thing, is basically how many photos are you shooting? Um, the robot comes with certain defaults in terms of how long it takes to shoot one photo. And this is like one of the issues that I've had with the button pushing thing is that it pushes down the button, but then it doesn't hold it down for long enough. And so the camera does like the focusing thing, but then it doesn't actually trip the shutter. Um, so you can build in extra time for that, but each, you know, sort of fraction of a second that you build in adds to your overall time. So if your panorama is a hundred images and you build in a 10th of a second, it doesn't add that much. But if you're shooting a thousand images and you build in a couple tenths of a second here and there, um, it will add up. Um, so that said, um, you know, a typical one for me takes like 10 or maybe 15 minutes to shoot. And then a really big one for me would take like two hours to shoot and multiple batteries. Uh, so you'd have to swap the batteries out um, uh, repeatedly. One additional variable that I'll throw in before I turn it over to Jen and Bill is that I've uh, shot some of my GigaPans with a big lens, a 400 millimeter lens. And so in that case, the robot holds the lens and the camera is just hanging off the back of the lens. But that lens is a massive object. And so that means that as the robot moves it, it kind of, you know, momentum makes it wiggle a bit. So you have to build in time for it to stop wiggling before you trip the shutter. Otherwise you get a blurry photograph. Um, Jen, Bill, what would you add? I, I wouldn't add too terribly much more. Um, I find about the same. I usually, if I'm planning a, a panning stop, as I'm out in the field, I would, I would usually guesstimate sort of 20 minutes to an hour. And again, it all depends on, are you gonna do a full 360 or do you just wanna do a narrow small outcrop that's right in front of you? Um, and it's, you definitely, you are, you are better off overestimating the amount of time between photos rather than underestimating the worst experiences getting back home and realizing in the middle of your 500 image gigapan that there's one picture missing. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I've got a great example of that. I'll paste it into the chat so you guys can feel my pain. Would you add? Um, I would I would add just uh, on top of that, one outcrop I was doing on a roadside, uh, I would have to manually move the gigapan and I had to shoot several times the bottom row because cars kept coming by. And so that you got to add in that uh, vagary of the process. So I had to shoot that bottom row four or five times that added another 
half hour to 45 minutes so that I would have images without cars in them. Yeah. Yeah, you do have to um, babysit the robot while it's shooting because of issues like cars if you're shooting outcrops. But also like here in Virginia today, it's a beautiful partly cloudy day. And if a cloud drifts you know, between you and the sun, suddenly your outcrop is in shadow, you shoot three shots, and then the cloud drifts away again and you're shooting in full sun. And that looks horrible in the final image. So you have to be conscious of that. And uh, if you don't have a crystal clear day, you know, stop it and start it again um, as that proceeds. And I think that was actually one of the other questions that, that we were gonna look at is what are the best lighting conditions? And honestly, I think my response was constant. You know, you want a sunny day or a cloudy day. You don't want partly cloudy and breezy, beautiful day to be outside because as the clouds move in front of the sun, it changes the shadows. I prefer overcast days because then you don't have sun direction or um, shadow problems. But, you know, that's, we don't get to pick the, the weather for our field work usually, unfortunately. Um, there's been quite a few questions in the chat about using Google Earth and then about annotating um, giga macros. So if we wanted to maybe uh, give Bill the floor to talk about Google Earth for a bit. Sure. And then we'll we can look answer at- answer some questions in the chat. Yeah. And I'll, this is Beth, I'll just um, jump in the moderator here and say that do I encourage everyone to keep an eye on the chat because the um, the presenters are in real time trying to answer some of the questions in there. Um, and then we'll pull some of them out for verbal answers as well. Go ahead, Bill. Am I free to share my screen or my desktop? Please. Okay, what's the best way to share? Just do the whole screen. Okay. So this is my personal laptop. It's not the college laptop, but I can verify there's nothing that uh, you'll see that could be embarrassing here. But there was a few questions about locating uh, GigaPans in Google Earth. And I'm going to be using the desktop version. So everything I'm speaking to will be related to the desktop version, not the browser-based version. I can't verify anything relative to the browser-based version. So. If you've used the browser-based version, Jen or Callan, uh, feel free to chime in here. So if you uh, wanted to take an outcrop and locate it, there used to be a geolocate wizard in GigaPan. It has been um, hidden, done away with, uh, for whatever reason, it was flash-based and it was never rewritten into HTML5. So older GigaPans, you can frequently find the Google Earth link here, but this one is a relatively new one that I located from a John Tudak. It's a nice outcrop. Fortunately, he gave the street address or the highway location near Elkins, West Virginia. So I spent some time finding where it actually was on a four lane highway to use as this example. Now, possibly Jen or Callan or others could tell you how to take any KML file and edit it. But here's a way to generate a KML file for this outcrop. And then all you have to change is the latitude longitude. So part of the API that's kind of on the backside of GigaPan, if it works, keep your fingers crossed. So this, this is the live view of this outcrop. If you go to your URL bar and just add .kml to the end of that URL, the GigaPan API will generate a KML if it doesn't already exist and ship it to you. Now you need your browser set up to not automatically open files to prompt you where to save them. Because you're going to generate a KML file and if you are set up to automatically open files, it'll open Google Earth. It won't save the file necessarily where you can get at it and edit it. And the default latitude longitude it will stick in here is in Palo Alto, California. So I will hope GigaPan's working. I'm gonna hit enter now. Let's see if it's working. It may not work. It should prompt me for a place to save it if everything's working. But a lot of the API on the back end is is uh, not being maintained and it's a little flaky. So if it's if it doesn't work right away, 
come back and try it again later. It just seems like it's not wanting to work right now. Of course. Oh, here we go. Yes. So it's asking me where to save it. And notice I have several copies here because I was making sure I had a copy in case it didn't work. So save it. And then go to where you saved it. Don't open it. Go to where you save it. Right click on it and open it in Notepad, some text editor. Um, just plain old Notepad will work. I used Notepad++, but any plain text editor will work. So I'll just open it quickly and you can ignore pretty much everything that's in here, except when you scroll down the longitude and latitude right here in decimal degrees, negative west, negative south, positive north, positive east. Uh, just change those latitudes and longitudes. Now here's a key, here's a secret. Don't put in the latitude and longitude of the outcrop. Put in the latitude and longitude of where the gigapan instrument was sitting when it took the gigapan of the outcrop. So what I did was I put the gigapan latitude and longitude on the opposite side of the highway from where the outcrop actually was. You shouldn't have to change anything else, but you can change the altitude. You don't want the image six meters above the highway. So you might change this back to one or a half. Were you aiming due north when you took the image? That's what the heading means here. If you were headed due east, put in 90. Um, can you see this screen? Is this okay? Is this showing up? Well, it's showing, but it's it, the text is super tiny, you know, and it's it open and, and everything else. It's I think it's a little difficult to see. Um, Bill, um, what about if you uh, copied and pasted this into the, uh, the the group Google Doc? Would that be okay if I change the editing permissions on that? Um, you're if if you're assuming I know how to do that, okay. The whole the whole file. Just copy the whole file you're saying. And we can look at it in that document file. Okay, I've changed the settings on the Google Doc so that anybody can edit it. Uh, everybody don't delete everything that's there, please. Everyone else will be mad at you. But now Bill can just dump the, the code in there and then you can look at it at whatever size you want. Okay, should I try to do that now? I reckon, um, um, so, yeah. Please do, <laughs> I think. How, how do I get to it? I'm sorry, I'm... Uh, We've pasted the link into the chat many times. Uh, just look for the most recent thing that Beth has pasted in there. How do I get back to the chat? Oh, here uh, it is. Yes, down there at the bottom. How do I get back to chat? Actually, right. you know what, let's, let's do this. Bill, can you email me the file and I will just post that while you're talking about it? Sure, sure. Um, And then I can go on and use the one that I've already pre-edited. I've already, I already have one made uh, to use. So um, email, you're assuming I know how to do that as well. Um, I have to open my email editor. The other option I have, I should have a couple KML files. You know what, don't even do that. I'll dump a KML file that's not yours in there. Okay, then I'll move on so that we can see it inside of uh, Google Earth. So I already did edit this file, change the latitude and longitude. Uh, so once you've done the, the editing, open Google Earth and open the KML, or I'm just gonna double click on the KML file and it automatically opens my Google Earth and takes us right to the spot. And magically there is the Gigapan sitting on the side of the road. Now, I, I, I've edited it just a bit. It, right now, it's just an icon. It's kind of a, a point uh, or a photo overlay, but it truly is a gigapan. If you start zooming, it becomes the gigapan that's out on the gigapan site. And you can get all the detail that Mr. Tudek here captured. He must be setting up a field camp 
experience for the summer um, to have this higher resolution. So one trick is to go over here to the right or the left side and right, uh, right click on the panorama and hit properties. The property box opens, you can't do much changes there. But what that lets you do then is treat the, uh, the screen in Google Earth just as you normally would and you can kind of look to see, well, is that really placed where I want it? Um, Notice the blue icon is on the right side of the highway here. And there's a distance value you can give in the KML. How far away from the gigapan point is that outcrop? And once you've in incorporated it into uh, Google Earth, drag and drop it from your temporary places so that it gets saved. Now, any questions there? Something that I'm not covering? Any questions there? Or anything I should point out? I was gonna to try to open my email and send that file. Um, so Bill, some uh, someone typed in chat, I forget who, um, that uh, it might be useful to paste sort of the before and after of the file so they can see the parts that were changed. Or maybe uh, if I may offer a suggestion, maybe just highlight the part that you changed, you know, make it yellow or blue or something so people can zero in on, okay, that's the lat long spot. That's the, uh, uh, okay. okay, before I post the file, I'll go highlight those changes in yellow. Okay. So um, Craig, you have asked a, a question about, um, um, oh no, sorry, it's Corey who asked this. Uh, Corey asked about uh, doing this in the browser-based uh, Google Earth, and to my knowledge, it is impossible at this point. Um, so that is uh, a tool that is not designed really for people who want to tinker. Uh, it's sort of designed to be a very basic level tool where you use um, the browser-based Google Earth to, to you know, scroll around the planet and grab spots that you see. Uh, I've tried it and failed. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's where that stands at this point. So somebody said, so students will need to download Google Earth on their laptop. So at the moment, if you're trying to do gigapans in Google Earth. You would need the yes, desktop version. You would need the desktop version, not the web. You would need the desktop version if you insist on it being in Google Earth. However, you can use the browser-based version to you know explore the landscape and then put, um, you know, say screenshots in there that then link directly to the Gigapan site or preferably the Gigamacro site. Okay, um, should I do a demonstration of uh, importing an image into Gigamacro and then annotating it? Um, it seems like that might be useful. Uh, so let's see, how do I share my screen? I'm gonna stop Bill sharing, sorry, Bill. That's okay. I thought you already had. All right. And um, let's see, where am I? I'm here. All right. So um, I was searching for that uh, image of the White Mountain Escarpment in Wyoming, and um, I uh, uh, was not able to find it through Google, um, or I wasn't able to connect because the stupid Gigapan site was acting squirrely again, and probably that's because all hundred of you are, are on there right now. But I was find with the, you know, when you hover over the Google link, what the um, number is for that particular image. So um, all you need to do to add an image to Gigamacro is once you have an account, you go up here to the little plus symbol in the upper right and click add image, right? Not add collection. And you can either upload one at this point, 
or you can add a link to an image on Gigapan. And this is what I'm gonna do. So I'm just gonna paste that number in there. It's a five digit number. Some of them are six digit numbers. Really old ones are four digits. Um, and then I'll click add. And then it brings it up, all right? So now it, this website, Gigamacro, is pulling the imagery from Gigapan, but it doesn't matter that the Gigapan website is not working for you know, regular users, okay? It's only accessing the image tiles. Plus, it's brought in the metadata, and that's what you see in this little box here on the right. So I'm gonna edit that metadata now, okay? This is an important step in my process. So it's just pulling this stuff from the Gigapan site. This is one of my own images. And you can see here, um, it's got a description of what's going on. It's got a title. It's got a space for attribution. So if you wanna make sure that you know this is attributed to you, you could go ahead and type your name there. You could even put a URL like to your uh, faculty website or something. You get to choose a license. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and choose Creative Commons non-commercial. So that's my preferred license for these images. You could put some tags in there. I don't usually bother with that. You get to choose your scale um, in pixels per whatever unit of distance you want. And um, you can choose the background color if you want that. And then this is important. If you wanna actually share this with students, you need to choose um, to make it uh, public or unlisted, not private. The default is private, which would prevent anybody from finding it again. So I'm gonna save it now. And now that's part of my um, you know, uh, portfolio, I guess you could call it, on Gigamacro. So now this, um, I guess there's two things I'd like to do here. I'll show you first how to um, set the scale bar. All right, so this is pretty straightforward, but it requires you to have something of known size in the field of view. So somewhere in this image, there are some geologists on the outcrop. There they are, okay. So I'm gonna assume that those people are two meters tall, okay? So I'm gonna click calibrate scale. I'm gonna click this man's head and then I'm gonna click his feet and I'm gonna say that that's two meters. Okay, boom. Now it's loaded up a dynamic sense of scale and you will see that that scale bar down here in the lower right changes as I zoom out or as I zoom in, okay? Um, that also then allows you to measure things. So say you wanted to measure you know, how, um, tall this outcrop is, you could go ahead and start here and go down to the bottom and that's 52 meters, all right? Um, you can even save that. You can see there's a little save tool here where you can save that measurement to your account, but um, you can also just make that measurement. Um, next to the measurement tool, oh, and the other option for uh, the measurement tool is um, measure an area. So if you wanted to say measure how much area was exposed in this box, you can see that's you know, around 2,000 square meters, all right? Pretty handy. Okay, um, this is the rotation tool. So you can rotate the image in any direction you want. Um, each of those rotations, you know, or, or, or zooming in or zooming out, that changes the URL up here at the top. And so if you wanna get it to a specific, you know, orientation, level of zoom, whatever, that has a unique URL associated with it. Finally, um, I will demonstrate annotations. So you click on the little pencil, it says create a new note, and that note could be a point, it could be a line or a polyline, it could be a rectangle, a circle, a shape, or you could do freehand. Let me just do a line real quick, okay? So I'm gonna click here, and I'm gonna click here, and then I'm gonna click here, and I'm gonna double click here to end it. Now I can describe that as test line, um, give it some information. I could ask a question here. I can change the color of that line. Maybe I want it to be yellow. Um, I can choose icons like a question mark. And then again, I have to choose the visibility, whether it's public or private. And if I want my students to see it, it's gotta be public. All right, so then I save that, okay? Um, you'll notice that the little box associated with that annotation is up, but you can close it, all right? If you wanna reopen it, you just click on it again. Um, while you're, sorry, Callum, while you're ahead. still there, I was thinking about that we had a question about the measurement tool. If you can calibrate your measurement tool to multiple images and, and what you find the accuracy tends to be. Okay, so uh, you have to um, do this measurement tool on a case by case basis. It's not like you can just say, I want all my images to be, you know, one inch per pixel. Um, it has to be done on an image by image basis. 
Um, with an image like this, of course, scale varies because part of the image is in the foreground and parts far away in the background. So you've got to calibrate it uh, to sort of a best fit for the area of interest that you're going to be using in your instruction. Can you do it using multiple objects within this field, or would you only do it on the one geologist? Um, it only, you can only calibrate the scale to one feature in the landscape. So um, you can, I mean, in, it, it matters in an image like this, it'll create inaccuracies because these sagebrush, you know, these are not, uh, you know, uh, as, as big as they might seem to be based on the scale and the mountain in the background would be even further away. But with images that are shot of sort of a flat outcrop face or, or close to flat, you'll get less of that variation. Um, does that answer the question? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. I just wanna show the freehand one real quick. Um, I'm just using a computer mouse here rather than you know a stylus but I just want to demonstrate how cool this is, all right? You can make all kinds of weird shapes and then it'll preserve those as annotations. So you could trace out, you know, uh, minerals in a thin section or fossils in an outcrop or uh, landscape features or whatever. Um, and then you get these distinct little um, shapes that pop out. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and maybe take some questions. Are there any in the chat that I should answer immediately, Jen? Um, I don't see any, but I might have missed some when I scroll back. So one is if we want to annotate existing images that belong to someone else for teaching, is it better to create a copy and go from there essentially? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I think that's exactly what you need to do. So you should seek the permission of the, the person who authored the image, of course, but if they've already licensed it as Creative Commons, non-attribution, non-commercial or whatever, you can go ahead and bring it in here. And then during that um, metadata step, you know, you could just scrub the image of any identifying information. So you could say mystery location um, rather than uh, White Mountain Mineral Reserve. And say, you know, test question three or whatever. All right, and then that changes, you know, the information that's available to the students as they look at it. So yes, you could bring in my images and you could call them whatever you want and you could annotate them however you want. Okay, I haven't looked at the chat in a while, so I'm gonna do that. Um, if there is anything else, uh, I'd be happy to hear it. There's a question in the chat about the distortion between the center of the image to the edges. And um, I mean to take that. Okay, so um, I was so I was going to say I have a pan that illustrates that. If you give me a few minutes to to kind of track it down. Great. So um, again, this is going to be uh, one of these things that varies. There's no there's no single answer to how much distortion you're going to get. But um, you know when you look through a camera lens. Um, or any kind of lens, there's gonna be more distortion at the edges than right in the middle, all right? This, this effect called parallax. And so the gigapan being composed of many different individual images is gonna have some distortion due to that parallax. And that's the reason that the images overlap by as much as they do, around 30%, so that the most parallax affected regions of the image can be chopped off and thrown away. And therefore, the least distorted portions of the image are the ones that are stuck together to make the final image. Um, but you know, if you're um, you know doing a, a gigapan like the one I just showed you, where it's shot from a, a individual spot and you're looking to the east, and then you turn and you're looking to the west, you're having a direct line of sight with each of those. So it'll create a um, the final image will be essentially like a, a wraparound kind of billboard that surrounds you. And if you're looking in that direction, you won't have any distortion. However, if they're shot differently, you may get some distortion, which is maybe what Jen is going to show us. Or not, because the gigapan site is down again. OK. Maybe, maybe I, I know that you've talked about this before, but maybe as people learn more about it, it might be helpful to have a repeat of the difference between gigapan and giga macro sites. Yes. Okay. So and, I'd be happy to do yeah. that real quick. So 
it's a little tricky the language here, right? Because I, I tend to refer to um, all of these images as gigapans, um, regardless of how they were originally shot. Uh, it's just a simple little word, right? It's a portmanteau, a gigapixel panorama. Jen shortens it to pan, all right? Um, but uh, a gigapan site was sort of the first place where people were uploading these things. It was run by the gigapan company before it went under. Independently, there is a separate company that has not gone under, uh, Giga Macro, and Giga Macro um, has built their own imaging system that's different, and it's focused on small things. They also built their own viewing platform, which I think has some real strengths relative to the Giga Pan platform, you know, most important of which is that they maintain their website. Um, but then it's also got all these tools and, and uh, annotation features. I also find that the image quality is a little bit crisper, um, and I'm not really sure why that is, but um, it, it is crisper. The one thing I don't like about the Giga Macro site is you zoom in in steps as opposed to a seamless zoom. Um, so that's one strength of the Giga Pan site. Um, there may be some other sites out there too where you can host similar imagery. Um, at some point, I saw a question somewhere um, from one of the participants in the webinar asking about uh, hosting images locally. And yes, you can do that. In fact, Bill Richards is probably the guy to talk to about that. Bill, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, your approach uh, to hosting images on your own server? If, if you created the gigapans yourself and um, have a way to convert it to the tile pyramid, you can host them fairly efficiently there are other uh, open source viewers for the GigaPans. Uh, open Sea Dragon would be the term to search for. There's, there's one that's maintained by the National Institutes of Health, so it's, it's very well supported. Um, there is a method to download GigaPans from the GigaPan website if you have the contributor's permission. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. But if, if you've created the GigaPans yourself and you can save them locally, there's various utilities that will take the a giant stitched image, say in Photoshop, and zoomify it or actually save it as a deep zoom tile pyramid. Then you can use one of these other open source viewers and just host them locally. I have about 50 that I use very much consistently. Many of them are the late Ron Schatz uh, images to, to make sure that my students have access to them, I've hosted them locally and linked to them in my Canvas course site. Uh, and it's not for the faint of heart, but it works. It doesn't take a lot of resources to host them locally, as long as you're not gonna do a whole lot of fancy stuff. If all you wanna do is view them and look at them and have students send you a screen capture or something like that, it, it's, e it's easy enough to do. It looks like there's a question. What about the shooting distance to have a clear photo and right measurements? That was back a little ways, but I didn't want to miss okay. it. Okay, so it totally depends on your subject. You could shoot a subject very close up, as I've done with the images of hand samples and sediment samples and things like that, where we're shooting literally from you know a, a few centimeters away to you know something on the landscape scale. So it doesn't matter. Um, one thing that um, does matter if you're shooting some subject that is at a variety of different distances from you. So I, I live in Virginia, and so a lot of my outcrops have like trees or, or other objects between me and the outcrop. Um, it would be important in that case not to put the camera on autofocus, all right? Because if you have it on autofocus, then it'll, it'll take a picture of the rock, it'll take a picture of the rock, then it'll be pointed at a tree and it'll focus on the tree and ignore the rock. So in that case, you wanna have a set focal uh, distance. So you have the focus on manual and you're just shooting the rock. However, if it's say a cliff of rock and um, you're standing you know, 20 feet away from it, the top left corner of the cliff is gonna be further away from you from the center of the cliff at the bottom. And so you need to build that into your thinking as you shoot the image. So um, you can set your camera settings to maximize the depth of field so that becomes less of an issue. Um, but another way is if you don't have objects between your camera and the cliff-like outcrop, 
you can just set it on autofocus and then it'll go ahead and match the focus uh, for each exposed part of that um, uncluttered outcrop. So someone asked, um, Kellen, I'm currently using your GigaPan activity in Pearson Mastering. Can those be annotated too? So, um, yeah, so Corey, I'm not sure what's, um, what of mine is in Mastering. Um, I know that a lot of the GigaPan activities in Mastering were uh, based on images by Ron Schott, who Bill mentioned as a real pioneer in uh, geological applications of GigaPan and, and now sadly uh, has passed away. Um, and those were written by Laura Lukes, uh, now at George Mason University, but I um, haven't actually poked around there all that much to use those. So I'm not sure which images specifically are there. However, I can answer your question in a more general sense. And that is all the images I've made are available for public use and you can go ahead and find them. And then yes, you can annotate them following this procedure I've just outlined. If there's still questions about distortion, I think rather than sharing my screen, I've posted a link to the GigaPan that we did to try to get at how much distortion there is as you pan. This is a, um, a pan that is of PSA style posters in the hallway of our geology building. Um, and so you're maybe what, four feet away from these posters and there's eh, two or three of them. Uh, so hopefully this gives you a sense of, of how that detail is distorted. And I'll point out if you if you check the pan on the very far left of that image, it does look distorted, but you could actually read it if you zoom up close. It's not coming through. I think it may be having trouble loading for some people like me. So maybe if you could share your screen, uh, we would know what you meant. I think this is a good illustration of the uh, GigaPan site. So, uh, some servers and their proxies work differently, and so I can see it now, but somebody else in a different part of the country may not be able to see it. And I, I have no idea why, why that is, but uh, wait 15 minutes and it might change. So um, I am I am sharing my view of it, and you can. Uh, I don't know how much of a, of a how I don't know how well this is working over video, but you can see the the poster right in front of you. You can read pretty well. Um, this is actually this is actually um, a poster about our gigapans. So we're now panning our pans, and so even Matt, though this is way off, you still have a good sense that you can actually read this. It's a little meta, gigapanning your gigapan. So I will leave that link in the chat. That is a private GigaPan. So that's why it has all those gnarly numbers in the URL. Um, so you won't be able to find this by searching. You'll need that link. Um, it brings up something else I'll, I'll just mention. Um, as conferences are being canceled left and right and going to an increasingly uh, digital format, um, realize that your posters could be uploaded as images to GigaPan or to GigaMacro as well. And you can share your posters very efficiently that way, um, you know, allowing people to zoom in on the parts that they uh, find of interest. I think we've caught up with the questions that are currently in the chat box. I was wondering, um, Jennifer uh, or Callan, if you had any other questions from Tuesday that haven't been addressed. And, Otherwise, maybe it would be time to revisit the what's in the handout and see if there's anything that you feel like you want to elaborate on. I have one quick question uh, again from the this set of five that Daryl sent earlier. I think we've covered all the others, but Daryl asked, is there a cost involved to using Giga Macro? And the answer to that is no. There was a question that we had gotten in comments. I, this is going to be sort of a completely left of center question. Um, it was it was asking about uh, with accessibility requirements that are being uh, added to um, our online activities. Um, how can we how can we make the gigapens accessible? 
Um, the short version is if you are using, um, and I checked this with, with my sites last night, um, if you are using iframes to embed your pans in a web page, the iframe tag does not take the alt tag option. So it will not flag as inaccessible because it doesn't have alternate text. So that is something that, that you would need to do is, is, and this is a great place to use snapshots, to use annotations with Giga Macro, and put in descriptions of what you are showing if you have a student who needs that additional help uh, to interpret your, your images. And I think we've just gotten a whole bunch more in the chat if you if if we want to. So one from Corey says someone told me Giga pans were created by stepping parallel to the axis instead of remaining stationary and turning the camera. Am I imagining things? So I just answered that for Corey. Um, oh, okay, sorry. You're not imagining things because there are ways to capture images that way. Uh, that's the procedure that the Giga Macro Magnify 2 imaging system uses. The camera is physically moved in space in three dimensions. But with Giga Pans, uh, in the strict, you know, original sense of the word, they're basically pivoting around a common point. As, as far as that goes, you can, and I've done some experience with or experiments with this, take a series of Giga Pans that you're moving laterally and then stitch them together. Um, it works. It's kind of gnarly, and it doesn't always line up, but it does. It does work. Um, there was another question about could you control the number of photos that are in a gigapan um, when you're using the robots? And the answer is yes and no. Um, the the gigapan robot automatically calculates how many images are needed or how many photos it will need to take to cover the pan that you identify. So you identify the, the upper left corner and the lower right corner, and it says, okay, I need X columns and Y rows to do that, and X times Y is your number of photos. But you have um, control as to where you set those two points. So if you decide you don't want to take 300, you can take 150 by changing the size of your pan. And you can adjust the amount that the images overlap but the less overlap you have the more likely that you are to have seams between your images or gaps between your images so you're better off i think taking more photos and just taking that little bit extra time just to make sure you have complete coverage of what you want in your image so there is another question from brian i think um it can we, is can i, can I you, just add okay. something Real quick to what Jen just said, and then, uh, sorry to step on you there, Beth. Sure. Um, I often, um, you know, if I'm not quite sure about, you know, where I want a panorama to end, I do end up shooting that extra row, and then frequently that gets cut out on the on the, the cutting room floor. And when I'm, I'm actually stitching the image, I realize I don't need that last row. There's, it's nothing but road surface, or it's nothing but sky. And the Giga Pan Stitch program allows you just to, to select that entire row and delete it, um, which is actually a pretty handy function, or that entire column or, or two columns or whatever. Um, so yes, um, it's better to have more and then trash it, you know, when you get to actually making the image than to not have it there at all. Beth, back to you. Oh, I was going to say, um, it's, so Brian said, it's been a while since I was experimenting with GigaPan, so it sound, so it is really good to have this workshop, sorry. One thing, I tried to place a marker on the cliff for a vertical outcrop, impossible top to get to. I did this by locating the frame, downloading it, and placing in Photoshop a letter, and then uploading the specific image back to the whole shoot to have a treasure hunt. Um, I guess comments on how, you know, whether you think... What do you yeah, think that's, that? that's great. And um, Bill Richards has, has done some really cool examples of that. Bill, are, are you able to load up your, uh, your North Slope image maybe to, to show that hidden Turritella in the quarry? Um, any rate, yeah, so the way to do that is to have the image tile pyramid already built. So what I'm referring to when I say image tile pyramid, folks, is that there is, um, when these images, these Gigapan images are made, they're not actually a single image. There are image tiles and you load up eight of them at a time when you're looking at these images. And then as you dive 
deeper into the image, it's loading up new image tiles to match the position of where you're looking and um, the level of zoom. And so um, with the annotation procedure that I just demoed in Giga Macro, you're always gonna see where those annotations are because they're gonna be there when you're zoomed out and there when you're zoomed in. So what, what's being asked about here is um, something that is hidden, almost like an Easter egg that has to be found by digging deep. And so the way to do that is to put it only on that deepest level or one of the deeper levels of the tile pyramid, closer to the bottom of the pyramid where it's wider and covering um, a greater amount of space. So Bill has done that. Bill, are you able to share your screen and show that off? I, I'm not finding that one. I did it, I did it with the Dry Falls, Washington one. Okay, I, go for it. Um, I'm not finding it either. Uh, of course. So, yeah. All right. Well, um, hold that thought, folks, and, and Bill's going to search. I'll search. A question um, of, about benefits of shooting in RAW versus JPEG? Um, I just use JPEG um, because it takes up a lot less space on the camera. Um, a more talented photographer than me, I'm sure, would uh, opt for RAW instead so that they could do some post processing. Um, Jen, Bill, anything to add there? No, I always shoot in JPEG. Um, there is some post-processing of your final pen you can do if you end up with the EFX Citrus software. It lets you adjust some of the, the color balance, but this is after all the pans, the photos have been stitched together. Um, every once in a while, I, I have a bad photo, and so I end up going in by hand and editing the JPEG. Um, so maybe a raw would have been a better choice in that case. So question, Bill, I'm experimenting with your KML trick. Should the coordinates to in include in the edited KML be the camera location or the outcrop? It's the camera location, right? Camera location, yes. And then there's a, a parameter called um, near, N-E-A-R kind of misleading. And that's where you put in how far the camera is from the outcrop in meters. Talon, there's a question about measuring orientations of structures. Can, can we do that in a giga macro? I know it's not possible in the giga pan viewer. Um, yeah, it, you can't measure it directly because these are not three-dimensional images, right? These are 2D flat images. If you want to measure, you know, the orientation of structures, you need to have a 3D model instead. Um, so that can be done using structure from motion, um, photogrammetry, uh, or, you know, other systems for building 3D models. But that's not a strength of this medium. I'm ready to share the Dry Falls example with some annotation built in. Take it. Let's hope this works. Okay, does everybody see a gigapan? This is also a good example of a different viewer other than the gigapan site itself. This is a, the open Sea Dragon viewer. But if I zoom way in, is everybody seeing the lava tube annotation come yeah, into it looks view? Great. Um, you don't see that when you're out. Now this could be created by adding the term lava tube to that tile or to that series of tiles. Now with this viewer, one thing I can do is show you the tiles, the outline of the tiles at the different zoom levels. So as I zoom in, these are the different tiles. So I, I would find it hard to annotate if I didn't know exactly where the tiles were. So what I did to make this annotation was, fortunately I have a Photoshop with a computer that's lots of memory and I brought the entire six gigabyte image into Photoshop and added the text and then uploaded it to Gigapan, the, the single giant gigabyte image using the Gigapan upload utility. And that creates the Gigapan itself. So that's another uh, way to do annotations is bring the huge image into Photoshop. And memory's cheap these days, so. Um, 
that's the way I would go about annotating. Okay. Okay. Um, I've got a, an annotation thing I can show off here. So let me see. I'll share my screen uh, with this one. So I'm on um, a Giga Macro site, and I've got an annotated copy of um, this particular outcrop in Washington, D.C., where you can see a bunch of weird colors, uh, sort of uh, fuchsia and yellow and bright blue on the image. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this little button right here to put it into a comparative viewer. And you can see it just popped up here on this screen up here. I can clear that out again and I'll click it again. All right. And then I just have to find the matching image, which is, I think it's right here in the middle. Yes, this one. So that, and then I can start the comparative viewer and then you will see those two images side by side. So this is basically taking the original stitched um, Gigapan, um, you know, exporting it as a TIFF, bringing that TIFF into Photoshop, then uh, using a, um, a stylus, um, you know, on a, a, a Wacom Cintiq, a monitor where you can write on it, um, to annotate these, you know, Storolite pseudomorphs and these stretched out clasps and lichens growing on the outcrop and the contact with this granite intrusion. Um, and then you have options here in terms of how you compare the two images. So you've got swipe side by side, swipe vertical. So if it's swipe, um, you can go like this and you can see the annotations coming and going. So this is really nice because the original image and the annotated version are exactly the same size down to the pixel. So um, you, know, you can zoom in. Uh, oops, I've, um, I've botched it. Hang on one second here. Let me um, refresh this. And then hopefully, no, it's refreshing at the same point. Okay, so I got to step back. All right, let's start this again. Mea culpa, folks. All right, so I've got to sync the uh, views. All right, now do the swipe vertical. All right, so you can see here, it, the vertical swiping is what's happening here. And I'll go ahead and close these little info boxes. Um, but you can see those annotations coming and going as I go that way. And then um, lastly, we can do like a layered x-ray square where we're looking through the one at the other. Okay, so that's, these are what I would call durable annotations in the annotated version where basically I've replaced pixels in the original image and put in these color codes instead. And so as a result, when you zoom in on them, you see they get uh, bigger and they get blurrier. Maybe just so, the last question hasn't been answered yet. Okay, so hi at Jay. Um, uh, yeah, so the way I do this is with just screen captures. So um, in my um, lecture uh, lab for physical geology, which is one of the ones that's linked to in the, um, the document that we made, the handout, um, you, I, I assign the students basically to go in this LIDAR image in Scandinavia and find an esker and find the terminal moraine and find a kettle and find an outwash delta. And they, they're supposed to screenshot those and I just have them dump the screenshots into a Word doc, label them, and then they submit that Word doc to me. So I can very quickly go through that Word doc and be like, yep, that's an esker, that's not a kettle, and so on. All right, well, we're very close to the end here. So um, I just wanted to say, is there anything else that any of the presenters would like to say about what's on the handout? And I will put the handout um, and then we'll one more time. This is the same one that was on Tuesday and um, with more information added for today. And then, then we'll wrap it up. Okay, um, at the end, there are two example like photo sets that Jen was kind enough to upload where you can practice with those. So, um, you can download a copy of Microsoft Image Composite Editor if you're on a PC, and then you can bring this photo set into that and um, practice with it, see if it ends up yielding the same panorama that uh, Jen posted as her final product. And that'll give you some experience with monkeying with this. It'll take a little while, which is why we didn't do it here in real time, um, because it takes time to process. But that way you can have a, a basis to ask further follow-up questions to Jen or to myself.
Yes, and, and definitely to follow on with that, I think our email addresses are in the top of that doc. We can add uh, Bill's information um, if you have more questions. Um, just above the links to the to the uh, example photo sets to stitch, I, I have a little short video that we had put together for a GSA. If you want to see what it looks like when a pan is in action, how you set up a pan, what it looks like when the robot's working, how does the stitching software operate? It's just a quick seven minute. Um, you can read through those. Uh, anything else you'd like to add, um, Bill? I think I kind of stepped on you there. No, that's okay. I did upload the KML doc file uh, to you via email. I don't know where you put that, so I just wanted to- The KML file is on the very end of the doc, so there's now three pages plus the KML file, and Bill has highlighted the places that you need to edit uh, for your the specific location of your camera and your pan. Well, thank you everybody for attending and thanks so much to our presenters. Um, and next week, they'll be the last in this remote digital tool um, uh, and that will be related to virtual landscapes. Thank you so much. Take care everybody. Thank you.